less programs and the password is uh, visitor pass. Please don't eat or drink in this room. Uh, and if you spill something, please let us know. Um, then we will actually have pizza and the networking will be in the community room outside of here after the talk. And if during the talk you have to go out and the door is closed, there is that red button over there that you can press to exit. Um, also, we would really highly appreciate if you could use your own cup. If you have forgotten that, that's OK. We provide some uh, plastic cups, but please only take one for this event. Um, and uh, the bathrooms are actually in the community room just next to this door. Um, and final thing is that if you need any help, the R ladies people have these stickers. You can find us and ask questions. Um, we would like to actually acknowledge and thank all of our faithful sponsors. We have had CSL sponsoring us for so long now. NAS, Zendesk, Matt Ritchie from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, and uh, Zendesk, as well as the our consortium. We are very much grateful to these sponsors, without whom we couldn't actually be here today. We would like to specifically thank Eliza because they are actually recording us um, all this event um, today and it's going to be a live streaming straight away like going to the YouTube channel people can see us live which is great and we also provide the recording after the event if you want to have a look later on. So it brings me to introduce our amazing speaker today. So I think there is barely anyone that uses R and doesn't know Hadley. Hadley is chief scientist at our studio. He's a member of our foundation and adjunct professor at the Stanford University and the University of Auckland. Earlier this year, he won the prestigious Corps President Award, which is sometimes referred to as Nobel Prize of a Statistic, uh, in recognition of his great contribution to the field of a statistic. We all know that he has made a lot of amazing packages in R, and some of us use those packages in daily basis, like very routinely. Things like ggplot and all the tidyverse suite, basically. And he has also made packages that help us to develop software much like, more principally and easier. Uh, we are all very happy to have Hadley today, a person who has made data science for all of us much easier, faster, and basically with much more fun. Please join me in welcoming Hadley. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of what it is that I do exactly. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about this because, you know, I like won this award and I like turned 40. So this is kind of the, <laughs> the, the closest attempt that I'm going to have at a, a midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, I also changed my uh, cell phone plan and my backup provider this year. So full-on <laughs> midlife crisis mode. <laughs> but sort of for a while, I've been wondering, like, you know, what, what are the sort of things that I do in my job to have like an impact on the world? Because I was trained as a statistician. I have my PhD in statistics. Die, my uh, PhD advisor is here. But like, I don't feel like I do statistics. Like, I don't ever write down formulas, basically, ever. Um, so the kind of the, the skills I learned in the classes of my PhD don't really apply to what I do day to day. Because a lot of what I think about is, is like digging this pit of success. And like a pit of success is very different from a pinnacle of success, right? Because to get to a pinnacle of success, you've got to try really hard. Hopefully, you just like fall into the pit of success. <laughs> so, the kind of goal is that like <laughs> eventually over time, your fingers just type R code and you can spend your precious cognitive resources like thinking about the data, not getting what you want to do out of the, to the data out of your head and into the computer. 
And I'm really motivated by this quote from John Chambers who, who invented S or co-invented S, the language that preceded R, that from the very beginning, the, the point of R was not to be just a programming language or even to be a programming language. It was to be an environment where you could fluidly and fluently interact with data. And just kind of over time, you might like slide into programming. And I think this is one of the really neat things about R as a programming language. It's like a programming language primarily used by like non-programmers, by people who would not identify as a programmer or a computer scientist or a software engineer. But obviously like you're still doing programming, but you, you're not, you don't have to identify as a programmer and you only have to do like as, as little as possible. And so, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, I've been working on this collection of packages called the Tidyverse, right, where the goal is to help you do data science by providing you with various tools to solve some of the various challenges that you encounter when doing data science. And it's a little hard to see on the slide, but there are two black holes here. Uh, modeling and communication. Those are both like really, really important parts of data science, but not parts that I've kind of particularly have any like thing particularly insightful to say about because I haven't really thought about them that much. But when you look at these packages, I think you can sort of arrange them on like a continuum. We're in like one end of the continuum of these like data import packages. And data sort of problem, like 80% of the time it's just like utterly boring. You just take a function, you point it at a file, and you get a data frame of data. Like the other 20% of the time it's endless screaming. But <laughs> a lot of the time it's just, it's straightforward. Like there's nothing kind of really exciting going on in these packages. It's just kind of like good software engineering. You want like regardless of whatever type a file you have, whether it's a SAS file or an Excel file or a CSV file, you just want to slurp that data into R and your success criteria is that you don't like, that nothing goes wrong, it just works. R doesn't crash, you don't get anything weird going on. And in creating these packages, like by and large, there's, there's just, it's just software engineering. Um, you know, read Excel, there's, the other skill you need for writing a package like read Excel, so Excel files today are written in XML, and that XML is documented in a, and I'm not kidding you, a 1200 page PDF file that is ordered alphabetically by the tags that could appear in any office file. So there's, there's not, like there's no, <laughs> there's some challenge there, but the challenge is like reading through a two, a, a thousand page PDF to find the ex exact information you need. Like these are mostly I think kind of straightforward software engineering. And like some of these other packages like Purr and Stringer, like these, these packages kind of, they wrap around like originally mostly base R functions, but they, they don't really do anything fundamentally new. They just get rid of a lot of little frictions that you might have experienced. I think Stringer in particular is not, is that the, the contribution to the world of Stringer is like better function names, primarily. <laughs> so you have to remember like Grepple and Greg Expra and Gsub, like names that like made sense to the authors of R because these kind of echo the Unix command line tools, but don't really evoke the problem to most like modern users of R. And I think that's like, I don't want to, like naming stuff is really, really hard and I think is a, can be a really important contribution. But by and large, there's that, that's mostly like a little bit of naming and a little bit of software engineering. Again, the success criteria for these things is they just kind of work. Like you can just do a, whatever string operation and it just works. These packages, however, are a little bit different. Like ggplot2 and dplyr, I think what they give you are these little domain specific languages that let you kind of tackle new classes of problems that help you like express yourself. And there's obviously like a bunch of like programming and software engineering behind these tools, 
but I think their primary contribution is not that. It's about giving you these tools to think about a problem in a slightly different way. And so I've always kind of known like at this end, like this is like, this is software engineering. I've read like a bunch of books about software engineering. I certainly don't claim to know it all, but I feel like I feel pretty grounded in that, in that, that set of knowledge. But for a long time, I've wondered like, what is it that I'm doing in these sorts of packages? What are the, like, the intellectual tools that I am applying? And it's only really recently, thanks to some conversations with Hilary Parker, who's a friend that works at uh, Stitch Fix. She has a really great um, podcast. But I think the name for this, what, what's really going on this end is design. And so I want to talk a little bit about design. Like I'm not a designer. Well, I'm not like trained as a designer, but I think a lot of what I do is design. And so I want to first talk about like what is design? What makes it different to other things? And I'm going to borrow this from this really excellent book, uh, excellent, well, it's a book now, but this paper, uh, Designerly Ways of Knowing by Nigel Cross, who is a very, uh, very uh, influential English designer. And in this paper, he kind of contrasts design to the sciences and the humanities on these three criteria. Like, how do you transmit knowledge? What are the methods of inquiry? And what are the kind of belief systems? And I think what's interesting here is this sort of focus, like the sciences, humanities, and design are like these cultures. And so let's just take a look at some of these criteria. So the humanities, what do they study? Well, human experience. What do the scientists study? The natural world. What about design? What do designers study? They study the constructed world. <coughs> and this to me kind of really resonates because I'm not, like, you know, I care a little bit about the human experience of using my packages. Like our packages are obviously but there's something of the constructed world, like the, of the, 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 the world made by humans. And the things that like co, kind of co-evolve with humans in a similar way to like physically designed things do. So what about the values? Well, maybe kind of a, one of the values of humanity is justice. The sciences really care about objectivity, rationality, and truth. But designers, like, there's no, there's no truth. There's often no, like, best answer. You have to be kind of practical. You want to be a little bit empathetic with how people are using your tools. Really most cared about, like, is this an appropriate tool? Like, it's not like, is this the best tool? Because there's never a best tool. There's just tools that are good for, better for some purposes and better for other, than other tools. And then what about me? Uh, in the sciences, you do experiments, you do analysis. In design, you do modeling, not like statistical modeling, but thinking about like how can you simplify this complicated system of interacting pieces into a simpler like model so you can think about how the pieces fit together. There's lots of pattern formation, lots of synthesis. So what I, like, I feel like I have a sort of trained in like a classical scientific way. Mathematics is a little bit different again because it's not it doesn't quite fit in with the sciences because it's not like it's not you don't do controlled experiments by and large to like advanced statistics. It's more like thinking about there's, there's definitely this sort of concern with tr truth and like proving things, but like that's that's not what I do. So when I kind of read this, this like really I really enjoyed this because it kind of gave me a name for like what is it that I'm doing? What are the primary kind of intellectual tools that I'm using on a day-to-day -day basis? It's not science, it's not the humanities, it's design. So like this was really, I, I really like this because it gave me a name for what it is that I spend a lot of my time doing. And I really kind of believe in the sort of like the power of names. Like there's a lot of this sort of like primitive magic idea where like if you know the true name of something, you have power over it. And I think that's kind of true today basically because of Google. <laughs> like if you know the name of something, you can Google it and you can find out about it. Like if you know the name of a problem, you can Google it. You can take the name of the problem, add R to it and Google that and you'll find solutions to that problem in R. Like knowing the names of things, I think is like really, really powerful because once you've got that name, you can find out so much more information about it by Googling. 
But I also want to talk about like some of the things where I think design or like thinking about design like might help you as well. And so I want to talk about kind of three or four four sort of aspects of design. So first of all, that like design's iterative. You can never get things right like the first time. You've got to try multiple times. Most of the time, there's never like a clear like best thing. You've got to think about different constraints and what ones can you satisfy for a given problem. Design is affective in the sense that it's not just about like, it's not just a purely rational and objective. There's also human experience involved. And then finally, I want to finish up by uh, talking about who you should blame. <laughs> to illustrate this, this kind of idea that design is iterative, I want to talk a little bit about tidy data. And the idea of tidy data, if you haven't heard of it, is, is pretty simple. There's really, really only one key thing. And that is if you have rectangular data, what you want to make sure to do is to put every single variable in a column. And if you do that, and you're using R, but really if you're using like any tool, that is going to make the rest of your analysis much, much easier. Tidy data is just a standard way of matching the semantics, the meaning of your data to its structure. And tidy data is sort of an interesting problem because I've been working on it now for like the best part of 15 years, which <laughs> I find to be deeply horrifying. <laughs> And this sort of even more work before this because for a long time, like I could like look at a data set and be like, you need to do this, this, and that to it, and your life will be much easier. But I could not like articulate what exactly I was telling you to do. And I think this was really, I really worked on this a little bit during my PhD. Um, but the, the idea of like reshape to and identifying like what is tidy data was really driven by my need to teach this to people. Because me, like, me looking at your data set and telling you what to do does not like scale particularly well. <laughs> and the other thing I think that's interesting about this sequence of packages, reshape and reshape to and then tidy R, is it's not like a, a uniform sequence like where things have gotten better and better. Um, as illustrated, by these tweets which I've aggregated. So this one over multiple years. Like, are there any R functions you have to Google every single time? For me, it's spread and gather. Or I love tidy R, but I have to look at the documentation of these functions like every single week. <laughs> or will it ever, will tidy R ever be as nice as reshape two? Or do you have a, do you have a good mnemonic to remember which is which? And I have to say, like at the time I wrote Spread and Gather, it was like painfully obvious to me which was which. <laughs> and then <laughs> Jenny Bryan like told me this metaphor. I don't even remember what it was, but it involved toothpaste. <laughs> and it like broke my mental connection. So after that, I had to like look up every single time. <laughs> And I think that's like a bad sign when the author of the function has to read the documentation <laughs> to figure out what's going on. And kind of talk, come back to that later about like, I think the other thing is it's very, when you find yourself doing this, like Googling for something, you just can't, like it doesn't stick in your head. It's very natural to like blame yourself. And that's completely the wrong instinct, which we'll talk about later. And so this led me like, earlier this year to sort of sit down and think, well, like, what are the problems with this function and how can we do better at naming them? And this is one of, and I think there's some evidence that this is like how I collect evidence is by like carefully collecting <laughs> tweets. Um, <laughs> but I think there is some evidence that people do actually find these easy to use. And like, I find them easier to use because I can just start typing in them and like fill in the arguments and I don't have to look at the documentation every time. So they're certainly not perfect, but they're, I think, a lot better than the previous iteration. And I really, I included this one, but <laughs> I wasn't sure if this was actually a compliment or this is just like a pun on tables have, <laughs> have turned. But what's interesting about, um, I think, these names is one thing I wanted to do this time is figure out, like, what are some better names? Like, what are names that are going to stick in people's heads? more naturally. And to figure that out, I did like a little kind of experiment slash survey. So I wanted, so here are two tables. Um, they represent the same data in slightly different forms. 
and you can't, you don't have enough information to say which of these is tidy and which of these is not. But certainly, the, but, but a lot of the times, like when you're tidying your data, when you're trying to get variables and columns, you're going to either go from this form to that form or that form to this form. And so I wanted to figure out, like, what, what are some good words for that? And I wanted to do so in such a way that I didn't, like, prejudice you by putting words. So I did a little survey and said, like, how would you describe table A compared to table B and then table B compared to table A? This is like very simple survey. It was a Google form and then I just like tweeted it. So not like no, um, no, it's like a purely 100% convenience sample. But I think it was interesting because like 80% of people describe table A as being wider than table B. And a little less, but about 70% of people describe table B as being longer than table A. So there's a pretty clear different, like a pretty clear winner here. Um, there are also a bunch of like others. Uh, very good advice is to never have like a write in comment on the internet. Uh, <laughs> these are like very humorous, <laughs> not very useful, and sufficiently colorful that I don't show them in talks all the time. <laughs> but this kind of like, at least, you know, I, these was a multi choice, so I had some like kind of words that I'd like, you know, talk to people. Um, but this kind of confirmed to me that longer and wider were good names. And I wanted to emphasize that these are like symmetrical operations, like spread and gather, pivot longer and pivot wider are just two, like one goes in this direction, the other goes in that direction. And hopefully it's now easy to say that pivot longer takes this and makes it into the long form, pivot wider takes the longer form and makes it wider. And that should be hopefully much, much easier to remember. Now that's not the only thing that like change these functions or argument names and they do a, they have a bunch more features inspired by um, some other packages like cdata and data.table. Um, but I think overall these functions are easier to understand partly because of doing a little bit of research to find out like what do, how do people talk about these already. And I think it's really, really important to talk about this because I think it's, it's like when you're designing something, it's simply not possible to like sit down and kind of like prove that you have the right, the right approach. You have to iterate, you have to try it out and see whether it's gonna like stick in people's heads. And I think it's really important to accept the fact that you are going to make mistakes. Because the downs are the only way, the only way not to make mistakes is not to try anything. And that, that you know, the things don't get worse in that scenario, but they never get better either. Um, and like personally, like I really, like I really hate it when I discover that I like screwed up, I've exposed like now hundreds of thousands of people to like an idea that turns out to be bad. But I just have to accept that, like that's, that's part of what I do is tell people wrong things. Um, <laughs> and while I try and do that as little as possible, there has to be mistakes, otherwise things will never get better. And sort of inspired, sort of related to that, I think there's this really important idea of constraints in design. That there's, there's never like a perfect solution. You're always balancing different trade-offs. And one trade-off that I think is really fascinating to think about in the context of software is what happens when you discover that you've made a mistake with the design of your packages. Like maybe you realize that you've created some functions that are inconsistent, that don't work like all of the other functions. And actually I'll show you an example of this because um, I just kind of learned this one recently. Um, Let's just open up our studio. So normally, normally, normally when you read, like if you have a variable for X, There we go. Yeah. Just, Thank you. Okay. 
can just double check that. Yeah. Okay, normally, like if you want to rename something, right, you, you know, I've got this thing called X and now I want to call it Y. You do it like this, right? You put the old thing on the right hand side and the new thing on the left hand side. And the same thing happens in mutate. Like you put the new variable on the left hand side and the old variable on the right hand side. Or if you use rename, it's the new variable on the left hand side, the old variable on the right hand side. Uh, or if you use, um, this is a little bit different, but the same kind of thing, like if you're recoding factors with factor recode, you put the new level on the right hand side and the old level on, sorry, the new level on the left hand side, the old level on the right hand side, right? So the new thing always comes on the left hand side, the old thing always goes on the right hand side. Except if you're using recode from dplyr, it's the old value on the right hand side, the new value on the left hand side. And like I have literally no idea how I managed to do this given that everything else is the same. I have a vague, rem there's a similar function in plier, I think. Oops, let's see. The similar function in plier. Yeah, I think the problem is I was thinking about plier where I made this just bad decision a long time ago and then I copied it for dplyr without realizing it. But like this, like so what happens when you discover, like I discovered that recode is this major problem. Like it doesn't work, like it's inconsistent. And I think this sort of inconsistency is really pernicious because like you don't notice it, like you don't sit down and say, oh, it's always new level on the left, old level on the right. You just have this like internal mental model that most of the time it works and then you try it out with recode and it doesn't and it, and then like a lot of the time I think you start like questioning everything and you're like, well, which way is it? <laughs> and you, like you don't realize, you don't realize what the problem is. You just now have this sort of deep seated uncertainty. So what happened, well, so what should happen, like I've discovered I've made this mistake. There's like basically, I've got two options. One option is to just accept the fact that I've made a mistake and leave it the same because I don't want to break anyone's code who's using this function. So I could choose to be kind of like consistent over time. Like if you have code that used to work with recode, it's a solid principle that that code should keep working. But on the other hand, it would be nice, well, it wouldn't it be nice if all these functions could be internally consistent so that when you use these functions, you can like more accurately predict what the inputs to a new function is going to look like. And so I, I think this is kind of a good, you know, people fall in different places on the spectrum. Like I think R core, the group of people who design, you know, who commit to R itself, prefer to be like temporally consistent. They want code that you wrote 10 years ago to still work today. And like that's a, that's a nice property to have. <laughs> but I'm like more driven by internal consistency. Like I want everything to hang together so that when you're learning things, you don't have to memorize all these special cases that have kind of accumulated over the last 20 years. So kind of another way to describe this spectrum is sort of conservative versus <laughs> utopian. And I kind of like the, the sort of the feel of the world utopia, because utopians are like everything down, to like build the perfect utopia, which I certainly have like some, there's some desire in me to do that frequently. Um, it's not like this is like one end of the continuum is good and the other is bad. They both have nice properties, right? If you're trying to make things more internally consistent, it's easier to learn the first time. Like your ability to predict the behavior of a new function based on your experience with old functions is greater. Um, on the other hand, if you're already familiar with some in order to become consistent, you're gonna have new stuff. But the, the whole optimized for kind of tomorrow. Whereas if you keep code the same, that's really nice because code that people wrote a long time ago still works. But on the other hand, you've got to memorize more special cases. That's going to make learning harder. So this is sort of optimized in some sense for the past, for the people who already know this. And you know, there's always going to be some, there's no way to, 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 to meet all of these criteria at the same time. You have to make this trade-off. And where, like where you fall on this continuum, I think, is important. 
Now, at the same time, like you don't want to be, I'm probably, like this is where I would be in an ideal world, but the problem if you're too extreme is that you're, it just feels like everything is changing all of the time. And that's also not a good experience, right? If you, if you can't, if the code that you wrote like last week doesn't work today, that's a frustrating experience. So certainly I think either extreme is, you know, normal the best place to be, but somewhere in the middle, there's just this trade-off that you have to make. I just want to illustrate one little place of that with a little bit of R code, which I just want you to take like 30 seconds and run this R code in your head and predict what it's going to return. So pretty simple, just two lines of R code. So what's going to happen? So I'm creating a variable, a data frame with variable called x, y, z, and then I'm extracting a variable called x. So what is going to happen? You might expect that this would be an error, right? Because that variable does not exist. It is not an error because R has this behavior called partial matching. And this was maybe not the best idea, but like 20 years ago, like the, when you were in like a terminal, it's really nice, you can have like these long descriptive variable names and you only have to type the unique prefix to work with them interactively. Like that's, I think time suggests that maybe that was not the best decision, but it was a decision that made sense at the time. But today, like there's no advantage to it because you know, your IDE can auto complete that for you. So you just type, you only have to type the first few letters and then press tab and it'll say the entire variable name. But there's like no way to, like, because R core is fundamentally conservative, there is no way to change this behavior. And so what I did to try, because I think this is a dangerous property of frames that actually causes bugs or, or not necessarily bugs, but you'll get really confusing error messages, I created the Tibble, which is basically a modern reimagining of the data frame. And Tibbles, if you try and extract this variable, you're going to get a warning. Now, in an ideal world, I think this would actually be an error. But the thing that's kind of interesting with tibbles is they have to walk this very fine line. Like, they have to mostly behave like data frames. Because if they didn't mostly behave like data frames, it would be really annoying to use because none of your existing code would work with them. So they just try and skirt this fine line where they try and protect you from the worst of the excesses of data frame behavior while being mostly compatible with existing code. And I think at the end of the day, you sort of might wonder, like, is this like worth it? Like the, down, the other downside of this is now we have to introduce like a new concept, the tibble. And if you, have, you, know, if you learned R 10 years ago, you may have probably never heard of tibbles. And you, if you learned R 10 years ago, you use Twitter. You've probably never heard of tibbles. <laughs> and so there's also like there's this cost, right? Because we're introducing new ideas, which means that there is like more stuff to learn. And so I think it's reasonable to ask, like, is this worth it? Obviously, I think it's worth it or I wouldn't have done it. So I'm not the right person to answer that question. But I think that's an important question to ask. Sorry, Adley. Very noisy the sound, but this is fine. Is this not working? It's very noisy on the YouTube, but on the streaming, but it's still I'm noisy. And it's still happening on the YouTube channel, even after I fixed it. And yeah. you do, it sounds fine in this room, right? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, no. Yeah, there's a lot of... That, you know, yeah. I can hear that, right? Let's just, let's try and twiddle with this. Oh. Well, let's, let's turn it off. <laughs>
that could have been the culprit. Okay. Still good? Yeah. Okay. Okay, make some kind of gesture if it comes back. Okay, so design, part of design is like embracing these constraints. You can't solve everything. You can never get like a perfect solution that satisfies everything. You've got to be conscious of these constraints. Another thing that I think is really a really important aspect of design is that like humans are involved and humans have feelings. And so I think it's, I think it's really important to like acknowledge that and accept that. And I, it's not clear to me like how that like really affects my day to day work, but I think it, it's really important. And I just wanted to show like a few things right where I think about this a lot. And the first is like now if you want like your R package to be successful, it has to have a logo. <laughs> And I've just selected kind of, a, a, you know, some of these are packages, some of these are, are meetups. But, I mean, these basically make me happy. <laughs> because they're just so cool. I just realized there's a lot of Australian stickers here, which is not, this is, this is the same slide deck I've used before. It's not like pandering to the audience. <laughs> but I think this is, I don't know, I really like this part of the art community that's sort of embracing art and having a little bit of fun. And I think the other thing that's really neat about these logos is that you also have them as stickers, right? And you can recognize an art user because they have a lot of stickers. And I think that's neat because, you know, people are kind of tribal and now you can like recognize people like you, like out in the wild. <laughs> and like data scientists like need all the help they can get meeting people. So. <laughs> so I think this, this is like, I like it because it's like, it's fun. It like helps you meet people. You know, it helps you recognize other people like you in the wild. I think another, another person who I think is wonderful in the art community is Alison Horst. She's the inaugural artist in residence at uh, our studio. And so I commissioned her to, to make these, uh, this artwork for me for a talk I gave about functional programming. And functional programming like, has this, like, first of all, it's like a terrible name because um, it doesn't really tell you anything. But it has this like, reputation of being like this really hardcore, dry computer science material. But as an R user, if you can learn like, the, the essence of functional programming, it's like a handful of functional programming functions, you can do like a lot. It can save you a lot of time and allow you to solve complicated problems with greater ease. And so what I really wanted to achieve with these pictures is to say like functional programming is like fun. It's not, it doesn't have to be like this serious hardcore thing. Like anyone can do this, even these like little monsters. And I have to say like one of the things I love about um, Allison's artwork is this often like little stories like you'll see like this monster there's like this one monster right who's always like eating stuff <laughs> and then like at the end it's like a little sick because he's eating too many cupcakes <laughs> um, so like this this art I think it's great at making the community like more welcoming. it's not just this like dry programming thing it's something that any like anyone can engage with and another similar really neat project is by Hase Valim and uh, Desiree de Leon. This, this book, this, this introduces this introduction to statistics and R using teacup giraffes. And I just think this is like so, so, so amazing. But what I wanted to finish up by is kind of talking about, I think one thing that's really important about design, this kind of mistake that people make when you experience bad design. And I'll show this, oops, this video. There's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it. Do you ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? 
So these, these doors are called uh, Norman doors uh, after Don Norman, another very famous designer. Uh, who sort of identified this problem. So these are doors like that they have like something that very obviously looks like you should pull, but you actually use them by pushing. <laughs> and I think your instinct, like the natural instinct, is when you get a door like that wrong, you're like, like what is wrong with me? Like this is a, <laughs> it's like a door. How can I not use such a simple thing? Like your instinct is to blame yourself. But that's like completely the wrong instinct. You need to blame the person who designed that. And I think you experience this, like, particularly with software. Like, you, when you experience bad design and software, it's very easy to, like, blame yourself to say, oh, it's me, I'm not smart enough to do this. Uh, and so I want you to take away the message I want, like, no, you shouldn't blame yourself. Like, I mean, if, if you struggle to use the tidyverse, like, you should blame me. And I really recommend this book, The Design of Everyday Things, uh, with one caveat, which is I recently bought this book to, to reread it, and I bought a physical book, which I really do these days. And it drove me insane because the margins on the pages are so small that your fingers are always on the text. <laughs> It just made me like so like sad and angry that they took like this classic of design and they designed it in such a way you can't read it like easily. It's terrible. But the other thing I think about a lot, like doors are kind of easy because you encounter them all the time. I think the other challenge, like one I think one of the challenges of my work that I really enjoy is like figuring out like what are what are new metaphors that you need to get what are new names for things that you need to get in your head in order to do data science more effectively like one idea of this you know that's the idea of tidy data like 90 percent of the benefit of tidy data is having a name it's tidy data having a fairly simple definition like your data is tidy when every column is a variable like that is like 90%, you've got like 90% of the benefit of the tidy data right there. Now you can go like go away and Google and find out about more about it. But that, that honestly took me like five years to figure out how to express that. To go from like looking at your data set and knowing you should do X, Y, and Z to it, to be able to say these are the, these are the underlying principles. But I think there's like, there's a, there's a, a there's a cost to that. Like every time you introduce a new idea, like people have to learn it, they have to learn that name, they've got to start using it. And that's like, that's, that's tough. You've got to, like learning these fundamentally new concepts is hard. And so one of the things I kind of think about a lot and I am sort of increasingly cautious about, like as I am like programming in R, you know, like, 40 hours a week, basically. Like I am, like I live my life in R. And there are, there, are, there are metaphors that are like really useful for me because I am so deep in R. Like that is all I think about, basically. And, but at the same time, like, and I am really excited about them and they're really useful to me, but it's kind of dangerous to take those ideas and um, try and share them with the world. I just want to show you one. I should have copied him. I should have put this slide in. Um, my one kind of counter example, oh, did I copy it in? No, I didn't. Um, the one counter example of recent times, this comes from another talk called The Greatest Mistakes of the Tidyverse, so you know it's gonna be <laughs> bad. Is this idea of tidy evaluation and like seriously, <laughs> the theory is like, I think this is like, the underlying theory is like beautiful and I love it, but it's clear like the world is not yet ready for it. <laughs> and so this is like the downside, like there's, there's this idea of like, these ideas are like quasi quotation and um, quote, these are like really powerful ideas. But, and I was really excited about them, but I think I inflicted them upon the world uh, in a way that led to questions like this, like will tidy eval kill the tidyverse? Uh, and so we've kind of like backed off on that and now we have this like new embracing syntax which like allows you to solve like 90% of the problems without having to learn any of the theory. 
And this is, so this is something that I kind of think a lot about. Like what are the, what are the ideas that like I think are really cool, but are really like, like only I and a few other <laughs> odd people like me think are cool and useful. And what are the ideas that are important enough to like tell the world about? And there's sometimes there's no way to like get that right without sometimes getting it wrong and like telling people about this really cool thing that no one else likes. <laughs> And so there's this sort of like tension between like creating new ideas, new names, new concepts that fit the problem perfectly, but now are kind of surprising that you've got to learn these new ideas in order to use them effectively versus like taking an old comfortable idea and maybe just shoehorning the new stuff in there. Uh, you might need to like force it to fit a little bit, but it's kind of like a pair of comfortable old, of old sweatpants or something, like, like it fits and it's not too bad. And I think one thing that I think that is surprise that still surprises me to this day is like the the sort of the old idea that you can force a lot of things to fit into in R that has proved to be really effective is the idea of the data frame. Like the data frame designed for rectangular data, but it turns out there's a bunch of stuff you can shoehorn into that. You can shoehorn text data into that. You can shoehorn graphs into that. You can shoehorn images into that. You can shoehorn spatial data into that. And sure, none of those things might be like the perfect fit or the most natural way you'd like describe those data structures if there weren't any other constraints. But the advantages of putting things into a data frame, a data structure that every R user is intimately familiar with, generally outweighs those costs. So to kind of sum up, like my mission is to like dig this pit of success. Um, you know, I don't want to oversell it. I think I probably dug like a pothole of success that you kind of occasionally stumble into. Um, and the, sort of the way that I do that, I can now say the way that I do that is through design. That there's definitely like a bunch of what I do is software engineering. There's, you know, if I've known that for a long time, I've read a bunch of books about software engineering. But now that I realize that what I'm also doing is design, there's like a very rich, there's a very rich literature about design that I can start to draw on to inform what I am doing. Now, you know, like when you're trying to, you know, a lot of that literature is not very relevant because it's about, you know, designing like physical things, but there are a lot of useful ideas that I think that can be translated to what I do. So I kind of talked about four things, four aspects of design that particularly resonate with me that's iterative. Like it's sort of the, the thing that you are creating like co-evolves with the people that are using it. You can't get it right in a vacuum. You've got to try things out and that means sometimes you get them wrong and that's just the cost of doing business. If you don't make mistakes, things will never get better. Design is fundamentally about embracing constraints. I think one constraint that is really, really interesting is what happens when you discover a mistake in the interface for a package. Like, how do you repair that? Or should you repair it? Should you keep things the same so old code continues to work? Or should you change, th change things to make the function more internally, the package more internally consistent? It's costs and uh, benefits to each of them. Design is also you know, it's something that humans use. Humans have emotions. And I think thinking about how can you kind of bring the, like the, your full self to the, how can you integrate art and like enjoyment, I think is really, really important. And then finally, um, you know, if you, do, if you encounter badly designed tidyverse functions, you find things that just like fall out of your brain. Like don't blame yourself, blame me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hadley, for the great talk. Uh, you talked about the utopian and the conservative side when it comes to consistency or, uh, you know, internal or user experience. 
So the people in the middle, so this is kind of a problem that I have right now, and I try to deprecate uh, very carefully everything and make sure uh, you know users are informed about any changes. So the people in the middle, uh, what, what are the fraction of the people who are in the middle? Uh, because I understand that it's not quite practical to deprecate all the times. Thank you. So deprecating, like, let's to go back. Like, if you if you're deprecating, that's indicating you're changing things. Like, that that, that there are kind of like st there's certainly steps you can take if you do need to change things to make that process like to spread it out over time. And I think sometimes like spreading it out over time is the right thing to do. And sometimes you just need to like rip the Band-Aid off yeah. as fast as possible. And it's not always clear to me like what, what the decision, what the, what the principles you should apply to, to make that decision. So like, you know, de if deprecation, I don't want to like over, like this is me and an ideal world is like burning things down. Um, but this is not me in the real world because we are now very careful to change things gradually. We deprecate things when we do change things. We try and write useful error messages to help you like update your code. But to me, it is still important like to, 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 to make that change, even if it takes a long time. And to kind of circle back to that, that recode problem, like I have literally no idea. I don't, I don't know how we're going to solve this because recode is like so utterly round the wrong way. But I think what we'll, we'll probably have to do is just like say that this function is, is going to be taken away at some point in the future, take it away, and then several years later, bring it back again with the correct <laughs> interface, which takes a long time. And still, if you don't upgrade your code package for like your code for f five years, you're going to still going to encounter it. But that just seems like the, the kind of the best. It's about making these trade-offs. So what's wrong with Melton Cast? <laughs> uh, what's wrong with Melton Cast? Nothing's like wrong with them. <laughs> I, I think the the other thing. We go back to my little. The other thing that's sort of I think interesting with this um, journey is that each version of the package is in some sense done less. So reshape data frames that's really cool uh, and they are still cool but um, no one really used them <laughs> that much. They just, they just don't, there aren't that many tools in R. Um, they're sort of an alternative to tidy data frames. And so like Reshape actually, and, and Reshape did a bunch, you could do like a bunch of aggregations and stuff with it. And so Reshape 2 did less, like as I sort of focused in on this, these ideas of like what reshaping is. Uh, Reshape also existed before Playa, so it kind of did many of the things that, that later ended up in Playa. So Reshape kind of like hone in on this more of the purpose and then tidy our furthest. So it sort of fa feels like you're kind of like peeling back layers of the onion to eventually like get to the heart of the problem. And it just takes multiple approaches. And I think this is a great example of where like you, you can't analyze these packages um, just you by themselves. You've got to consider the whole ecosystem of other packages that are providing tools. And sort of over time, like things have like moved between packages, and as try to sort of understand like what the heart of the problem that each package is trying to solve. Um, I mean, reshape, you know, reshape is still on Cran. You can still use it. You're welcome to. <laughs> I actually, I just um, just last week, actually earlier this week, on the plane to Melbourne. In fact, I wrote the code that is going to remove. Reshape 2 from ggplot2. So ggplot2 still uses Reshape 2, as of the next version is not going to use Reshape 2 any longer. Um, and so the downloads of Reshape 2 are going to like fall off a cliff, <laughs> basically. Because I think no one really uses it now, except because when you install ggplot2, it's automatically installed. Okay. 
Any question? So, uh, Hadley, you talked about these old design things, which was fantastic, but I feel like there might be other people out there who, is, who are like doing similar thing, but they even don't know that they're actually designing these things. Yeah. Do you think it would be useful to have something like a forum for data science design people where they can actually talk about all the challenges that they have, even like defining a function name or even doing surveys, things like that? Do you think it would be useful to have something like this? Yeah, I think it would be useful. I think the challenge for any community is kind of getting that initial critical mass. And then if people don't know what they're doing is design, they can't like Google data science design forum. So like how do you, it's like how do you help those people find out what they're doing is design? And I, I don't know how you do that. That's a, hard, that's a hard problem. But I should mention, just to plug a book I'm kind of slowly working on. Um, I've been starting to write up, oh, I'm not, let me connect to the internet. Uh, this, I can just use this, I think. Hopefully. I'm um, working on this. this book that's called like the Tidyverse Design Guide where I attempt to kind of like write down like what are some of the reasons that we design functions the way that we do. Some of the chapters are just like, I don't know if this one, some of them are just like, yeah, sort of gibberish. Um, these are just like me dumping ideas down as I think about them. Some of them are like moderately polished so you can kind of like read them. A lot of this is driven, or some of this is driven by, like now that it's not just me working on packages in the tidyverse, I've got like a whole team of people. It's becoming increasingly important to, for us to be consistent. And one way to be consistent is to like write all this stuff down so we can be inconsistent internally. And then by and large, our philosophy is like anything we do to help ourselves should be done in public, so it should, should help anyone. And so hopefully that eventually you'll be able to use this to help guide the design of your functions too. So, so sorry, I'll take a question. We have one here. Yeah, okay. Hi, Adley. Um, you mentioned how deep in I your thinking is. I wondered if you sort of try to or, or um, approach looking at other languages or other tools and see how they um, deal with similar things because it's sort of design yep. is a you know, meta. Yeah, I mean, I read I read pretty widely across programming languages, so I'm always looking to see what you know what's kind of coming down the pipeline in other programming languages. What are techniques that are useful in other places that we might be able to port to port to R? Are there any that sort of stick into mind the last few years that have made it over or might make uh, it over? Most of them, like most of them, tend to be smaller things just because you can't port like stuff wholesale. Uh, I think like one, like one language that um, kind of been looking at a little bit recently is like Rust, which is kind of a modern C++. Uh, and we've been looking at this for like when we are writing like low level tools. Um, so one of the packages, so Jim, who's on my, Jim Hester, who's on my team, wrote this FS package, um, which basically provides a bunch of functions for working with files on disk. And one of the, the, the existing APIs we drew on was the Rust API because they've you know, thought about this pretty deeply. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the nice talk. I was uh, more asking a question related to the Our Ladies community. So I don't know if you have been involved in giving talks in other communities, but do you have any advices for our uh, members today or any vision toward the Our Ladies organization, maybe? Yeah, I, I, I have given like, I think I've now given like more talks to Our Ladies groups than uh, that's like the, in the last year, that's the primary place I've been giving talks. <laughs> um, I think, so I think like one of the things, this is tricky, like it's, I, this is one of the areas that's tricky for me to give advice. There's like some things that have like really worked for, worked well for me um, that don't always generalize. So like one thing I think that has served me really well is like 
making mistakes in public. But, and that's sort of like advice I used to give kind of unconditionally, but now I think there's like pretty good research to suggest that like if you're a white guy and you make a mistake in public, people are like, he is so brave. <laughs> um, whereas if you're like a woman or a person of color or other minority and they, people see you making a mistake, they're like, oh, what an idiot. Um, but I think that like, I think like providing like, like I think one, one, I think one thing that a potentially really great thing that, that could happen in our ladies groups or one thing that you can provide is a space for people to give talks about things that maybe they're not experts in and that's fine and you can give up, stand up and give a talk and maybe you'll make some mistakes and that's fine because you're in like a supportive environment where people aren't going to like, like that, having that space where you can make mistakes is so incredibly valuable because again that's what allows you to like try stuff out and like you can't get better without failing from time to time so like creating that space where you have like the psychological safety where you, you don't you know you're not worried about making a mistake or that you know you accept that you're going to make a mistake and that's fine and that's okay and people will support you i think that is like really really valuable um, such a great advice yeah any other question? Don't be shy. Yeah, we have one person there. Just a general question about the, the direction the R community is going. Do you think R will take over other paid software like Stata and SPSS one day? Uh, I kind of hope so. <laughs> um, especially SPSS and SAS. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I think like one of the, the I think the, one of the things that is wonderful about R is that because it is like open source, it is available to everyone. And I think like the, the, th the, the thing that's like neat is that now like you can use exactly the, basically the same tools that a professional data scientist uses for free. And I think that is, that is tremendous, like that you can, even like the sort of first course you take in university using data science, you can get that like basic authentic experience. Um, you know, like one of the you know, things that, that I think is needed at our studio, we have like our studio cloud. So you don't even need to have like a computer or a very good computer. You can like start using R, try this out. Oh, it's gonna try and log me in, I guess. Um, <laughs> You can like start trying this out, you know, for free. Why can't I just go to this website? Okay, this. Um, well, you can like start trying this out without having to, to, to worry about like, do you, is your computer good enough? Like how do, I, how do you get all the software? Um, so I think I've lost, <laughs> lost the thread of your original question. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, so I, I just like the value in R just seems so much greater. And I think now we understand that like you can teach, like you can teach a programming language like R and people do not find it massively worse than learning an environment like SPSS. There's enough experience in like intro stat courses now where they've switched from teaching like something point and click to teaching R and students don't actually hate it any more than they hate any class. Um, and so that like my hope is that over time we uh, will displace those, pro those languages. The other thing I would love, this is now getting a little beyond R, but the other thing I hope that gets killed in the near future is graphing calculators <laughs> because graph I don't know, maybe it's not so bad in Australia and New Zealand, but in the US, like, you have to buy a graphing calculator for high school. They cost like $120. They include like $5 worth of computing power, and you never ever use them again once you graduate high school. Like, that is just, that's just like evil, pure evil. <laughs> Sorry, following up from that question also, um, do you have any advice? For some, so I'm I'm in a, I work in public health, and the the golden standard is Stata, and we're slowly trying to get people um, excited about R, but we have a lot of backlash from um, professors because 
they know Stata and they don't know R. Yeah. Uh, and so they don't want their students using R because then they won't be able to understand their code. So we've, be, we've, be, we've started by telling people just do all your data cleaning and Stata and whatever and then um, plug it into R to make pretty plots yeah. with ggplot. Yeah. Um, do you have any other further advice of how we can kind of manage this generational transition? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, depending on your budget, there's always, like, targeted assassinations. <laughs> but more seriously, like, it's really about, like, meeting, meeting people where they are and, like, accepting, like, you know, people do have, like, most people's priority in life is not staying on top of the latest statistical programming. It's about, like, doing what they've been doing. And there's this immense, like, just the thought of, like, now I have to learn this whole new thing and the end result is I can keep doing what I'm already doing, but at half the speed, because I'm learning something new. So I think like, like acknowledging like people are where they are, I think that's really, really wise to help just like say, just keep, keep if you're, you're comfortable here, do it here. But I'm going to show you like one little thing that is hard to do in Stata, and here's how you do it in R. Uh, I think the other, like as well as plots, uh, another kind of vector is like reports, like our markdown and the ability to create like these polished reports where the plot is like directly embedded. And there's like the whole sort of like provenance. I, I, I think like finding, like finding these things that are painful, finding these like experiences where everyone has some horror story, where they've like dragged the wrong version of a plot into a paper or a presentation. Like working on that, supporting people where they are, and then just ex you know, accept that it's gonna be like a long-term process and that some people will never change and that's, that's okay. It's not your fault. <laughs> Of course. Um, is there a particular design challenge that you're working on at the moment or something that you see for the future or like your... So one, one thing, it's kind of a design problem. One thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is this package called Vectors. And the idea of Vectors is to provide some kind of like underlying theory that says like what types of things should our functions return. And I think vectors is a really interesting kind of space because if this is successful, you will never know that this package exists. <laughs> like the success criteria is basically you will use a tidyverse, you will look, take a tidyverse function that you've never used before and you will use it and it just works and it returns the type of thing that you expect. And I think this is kind of like, this is just sort of like a fascinating idea to me because like how do you evaluate whether or not you're being successful when your goal is to be like invisible so that people just never experience certain classes of pain? Um, I mean, I, this, I find this like really interesting because it, it combines like a bunch of stuff I like doing. There's this sort of like algebra that underlies it that helps you say, well, like what is the correct type of thing to do? There's this sort of like pragmatism. And then there's just this bunch of like, there are all these things in R that have like bugged me for the last 15 years and I'm now having a go at fixing them. Um, namely, like one of the things that Like what happens if you concatenate the current time with the current date? And this is the type of inconsistency that like drives me crazy. This is a capital D. It doesn't really matter. But when you concatenate them together, like you get today's time and you get a date in 1969. Or if you flip them around, It took me a while even to like realize, but this is a date, like this is the year 4,313,511 on the 7th of um, July 12th. And like this, you know, this legitimately does not cause many problems in practice because you don't normally concatenate these things together. But like really thinking through like what should this return? And if you use like vectors, Oops. It just like does what you expect. And getting this to like just work is kind of surprisingly, <laughs> put like a surprising amount of thought into making this work very, very broadly. 
Um, but, and this is something that, you know, hopefully you'll never kind of need to know much about unless you get interested in it. It'll just like slowly percolate through packages in the tidyverse and just things will become more consistent under the hood. Okay, cool. Maybe we get the last question, and then uh, before I give the microphone to you, sorry, uh, can we, uh, when we finish, you stay here and we all have a photo with Hadley so we can have it as a memory later on? So I would appreciate it. So we have the last question, and then you can discuss uh, over the pizza. Perfect. Thank you so much. So my, my question is related to Marie's, your response to Marie. Uh, she's from our ladies. So thanks for highlighting the unbiased view of some people on sharing your experiences and making mistakes. What was the impact uh, on your work after you shared your mistakes um, with others? Is there any positive feedback that can be encouraging people? Yeah, so a lot of the time, like, so I, I guess so like one, one place where I used to do this kind of tactically was on the R help mailing list. So the R help mailing list used to be like the place to go to get help. Uh, it was a pretty unfriendly place by and large, like legendarily so. But I discovered like kind of one technique there is like sometimes if you ask a question, like just like, like no one really cares to answer it and you don't get a, so just no one responds. But if you make an incorrect statement, <laughs> someone will correct you. <laughs> so this is like a technique that I have employed like fairly sparingly, but if you really, if I ever really needed to get an answer about something, I would just like make a statement and then someone would be like, no, you idiot, you're wrong. <laughs> Um, so kind of like learning to like kind of use that kind of a, in a useful way is helpful. But, but generally like most of the feedback I have got over the years has been like about, it's been positive and like I, I find like, like the breadth, like having many people think about the same problem and look at things and say to you like, oh hey, you just, you just haven't spotted this is like, like this recode example, like it's very, very difficult for me to see things like that just because it's so, like the things just kind of work the way I expect because I created them and then someone, oh the other thing that, yeah, another related thing is this function called dplyr one of, which you use like, um, let's just load, which you can use to select um, select variables. I really should have changed my, uh, I really should have, uh, appearance, yes, I should have made it. Oh, uh, now it's like so zoomed in that I can't see the, oh, uh, I ain't it, okay, no. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, well, I'm not gonna try and change my thing now, now, oh. God, how do I even get out of this? Okay. <laughs> well, no, I typed, anyway, so you use it like select, oh, now I have to type this again. And someone pointed out this to me, like it's called one of. So how many variables do you think this is gonna select? <laughs> Actually select all of them. And there's some, again, there's some, like, and again, like, so at the time I wrote this, like, this made perfect sense, because there's some grammatical construction, which I've forgotten, but Jenny and Brian reminded me of several weeks ago, and I forgot again, that, like, makes sense. Like, you're picking one of, anyway, there's some way to phrase a sentence in English where <laughs> one of makes sense, but now I look at it, I'm like, like I just looked at a, like someone pointed out to me, like why is it one of, it sticks all of the variables. And I'm like, hmm, that is a good point. <laughs> um, so in the next version it's gonna be called all of. But like, <laughs> and there's gonna be like an any of which allows you, which will pick any of the variables that are there. But like that kind of stuff, like that, just like putting my stuff out there, like all of the books I write in public, they're riddled with like typos and spelling mistakes and people just like come along and fix them which is awesome. <laughs> like that, that really works for me. Um, <laughs> no, this, this is great. Like, I wish all of 
fastest thing is the courage is enough to do that way, go that way. Yeah. yeah, I think part of it too is just important. Like I feel like it's it's good to like normalize failure and you like you see me typing and I like half half the half the letters I hit wrong and um, that that's just like how everyone works. Like if you watch me programming, like I am Googling stuff like all of the time. <laughs> uh, like I think it's easy to think like I am a better programmer than you because I make fewer mistakes. I think of anything as the opposite. I make more mistakes, but I make them faster. I am really, really good <laughs> at making mistakes quickly so that I can learn and like do the right thing. Thank you so much. So Hadley, we have a very small gift for you. Okay. Thank you again for the fantastic talk. We really enjoyed that. Please Thank join you. me and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe here and then we take it for sure, okay. If you don't want to be in the photo, that's okay. You can leave the room. If you want to, please just take a seat and take the photo. Yeah. It's challenging. <laughs> yeah. Sepi day? Can we do a selfie? Yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? Please. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Does everyone fit? Uh, not these two. <laughs> it was microphone. One, two. <laughs> Oh, this? <laughs>